1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 18 down through chapter 3 of verse 1. Paul writes, For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once. And yet Satan thwarted us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it be uh, best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor should be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now, we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. Now, last Lord's Day, we only got halfway through our sermon. So the beginning of the sermon today will be hitting the highlights of the truths that we considered last Sunday. And then we will pick up where we left off and by God's grace, finish the sermon. So by way of introduction and review and, uh, and help this morning, uh, we want to remember something, and that is that the Apostle Paul had a very deep concern about the people in Thessalonica. Paul had been there for about three weeks, preaching in the synagogue every Sunday. And as a result of his preaching, there were those who received the gospel, believed it, became born-again believers, and a church was planted, albeit a very small, fledgling, infant church. The days following, Paul was run out of town. And Paul is now in Corinth. And he, um, he's concerned about those people in Thessalonica. Wonder, wonder how they're doing. Because he knows that there's going to be persecution, there's going to be affliction, and that's going to be a testing of their faith. And how are they going to hold up? Are they going to just say, hey, not for me, I'm out of here. Uh, or are they going to persevere? Are they going to hold steady? Are they going to continue on in the faith? Paul tries to go himself to see them personally because not only did he want to check them out, he wanted to minister to them to help strengthen their faith while he was there. He tries a couple of times to go. He's thwarted, but he doesn't give up. He sends Timothy. And so Timothy goes, meets with the people. He's there with them for a while, and he comes back, and he brings good news. Can you imagine how thrilled the apostle was? This is terrific. This is what I... This is what I wanted to hear. And you know, I can just imagine how thrilled he was. Now, there was a reason why these people persevered. And that's what we've been dealing with. 
It's called the doctrine of perseverance and preservation. Two very important words, key words, sound similar, but they are different. Let's take preservation first. Preservation means to preserve something, to keep something safe in its entirety. Not to lose a part of it, not to break it, not to let somebody steal it. I'm preserving this. My grandmother used to make preserves. How many people know what preserves are saying here? Look at there. See, I know how old you are. <laughs> Preserves, yeah, Je jelly, jam, you know. In fact, they lived out in West Texas in a big two-story house and they had a storm cellar right next to the house. I'm not gonna ask how many you know what a storm cellar is. But it's a place you go when, when there's a tornado and they had them. And I remember seeing the dark clouds gather on the horizon. My grandmother was very nervous, very afraid. She would light the lantern and she was ready to go to the cellar as soon as granddad and I got back from the barn. And we would go down into this old musty cellar, cobwebs, an old cot, something to sit on, close the door and wait till the wind stopped. But on those shelves in the cellar were jars of preserves, fruit that they had grown on their peach tree, berries that they had raised. And these were jar, jars of, she called them preserves, jelly, jam, whatever. Why would she call them preserves? Well, because she was preserving them for six months or a year till we needed them, till we wanted them. They were being preserved. That's the word we're using. And it has to do with God preserving the true believer keeping him safe till he gets to heaven. But there's another word. Sounds very similar. It's the word persevere. Persevere means to keep on keeping on. Day after day, week after month, year after year, keeping on, persevering. I think in Spanish, I, perseverancia would be the word in Spanish. But to define it in Spanish, I can't think of a better word than to aguantar. Just to keep at it. So on the one hand, you have God preserving. But on the other hand, you have the Christian persevering. And the fact that the Christian is persevering is proof that God is preserving. Because if God didn't preserve, how is the Christian going to persevere without God's keeping him? So now we have the two words together. Preservation, perseverance. Now, I want us to look, we, last week we looked, and so this is still review. I'm going to have to not get bogged down here or I'll end up not finishing the message again. So there's three principles, three truths, three principles, basic to the preservation of the saints. Paul's basis for rejoicing about the believers in Thessalonica was this first principle, get it down, that all those people in Thessalonica who have been truly saved and joined to Christ would be preserved by God until the day that Jesus Christ comes back or you go to be with him. Paul was convinced of that. Now, in spite of that, here's the quandary in spite of the fact that Paul was convinced of that truth, all who are savingly joined to Christ will be kept by God until the day of, of Christ. So why bother? Why worry? But Paul was worried. 
What was he worried about? Why well, worry if God's going to do it? Oh, but there was reason to worry. And the reason is the second truth that we considered last week. Not all who profess to be Christians are truly Christians. There are those who make a profession of faith, but that in and of itself does not necessarily mean that there has been true and genuine conversion. People can say, yeah, I trust Christ. But have they really trusted Christ? And I use this illustration, I use it again very quickly. We used to have a jail ministry when we were in North Carolina. Every Monday night, a bunch of us men would go to the county jail and preach. And sometimes I would go in, there were other preachers coming during the week. And sometimes I would go into one of the cell blocks and a guy would come up to me and he said, hey preacher, guess what, I got saved last night. And remember, I told you how I would answer. I would say, you know, I'm so glad that there's at least some evidence of a saving work of grace in your life. And I sure hope that over the next days and weeks and months, there will be even more evidence of a saving work in your heart. I wasn't saying he wasn't saved. I was just saying I hope there's going to be continuing evidence of that salvation. So that's the second principle. Uh, then the third principle that we wanted to look at is that, well actually let me just make this statement. Um, this is the third principle. Let me state it this way. We've already alluded to it. The continuation of perseverance is the proof that God is preserving the believer. And that perseverance means he doesn't turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. He doesn't just assume that, hey man, great, once saved, always saved, no matter what. So I can go out here and live like I want to. That's not the language of a true child of God. True child of God wants to avoid sin, not look for an excuse to say it's somehow okay. It's not once saved, always saved, no matter what. It's once saved, always saved, if you're persevering. To take that other attitude is to turn the grace of God into an excuse for sin. First John says that one who abides in him does not make a practice of sin. And we must take that seriously. Now, we began considering why, why is it that a true Christian perseveres? Why would a Christian, what is the cause? And the answer to that is twofold. It has to do with God and it has to do with a believer. So why is this Christian persevering? Well, let's look at it from God's standpoint. There are certain things true about this man's conversion that have to do with God. There are certain things true about the conversion that have to do with him. And we're going to try to flesh this out and complete the sermon today, best we can, with the reasons that have to do with God. And let me begin by saying this. We begin with God, and that's the place where our salvation begins. God initiates the covenant of redemption, of salvation. God makes a covenant with us. And so we need to consider the nature of the covenanted mercy 
and we also need to consider the activity of the triune God. And let me just add to this. Our salvation is a Trinitarian salvation. By that we mean God is involved, God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it is a Trinitarian act of God. And God enters into a covenant. And the only reason why you and I can talk about salvation and understand about salvation is because God is the one who takes the initiative to save man. I'm going to try to hurry through this, but listen to the words of the Westminster Confession. The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience to him as a creator, yet they could never have attained the reward of life but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he has been pleased to express by way of covenant. And there are many covenants spoken of in the Bible. But there's one covenant that we need to consider, the new covenant. In Hebrews 12, 24, it says, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. The blood of Christ is the blood of the covenant. And when we come to Christ, we come to Christ as the one who is going to mediate that covenant with us. What are the distinct blessings of this covenant? We are sealed by the blood of Christ. And I submit to you, because of that, this secures the perseverance of the saints. Now, I want us to quickly have you turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Notice in verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. There it is. With the house of Israel, that is the true house, the true Israelites, the spiritual Israelites, those who are saved, Jews and Gentiles. And so this is spiritual Israel. Now, what are the blessings of this covenant? Look at verse 32 very carefully. He says, it's not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But now beginning with verse 33, look carefully at how many times I will is used. God is saying, I will, I will, I will. And he's describing this new covenant with the people of God. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And on their heart, I will write it. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Verse 34. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. What a description of the covenant, is it not? Notice how many times God takes the initiative. I will, I will, I will. And what's going to hinder God from doing what he wills? Nothing. Nothing. That covenant is also described in Ezekiel very, in very similar language. Now, notice the emphasis being on what God will undertake to do. Think with me. As fallen sons of Adam, what are our two most basic needs? 
in terms of having a relationship with God. Let me repeat the question. As fallen sons of Adam, what are the two basic needs that we have in order to have a relationship with God? We need to deal with two issues. We need to deal with guilt and depravity. Maybe I need to explain that. You know what guilt is. I don't need to explain guilt. We are born into this life guilty of Adam's sin. We're born guilty. Soon enough we become guilty because we sin ourselves. And because of that we're guilty for Adam's sin, we're guilty of our own sin. We're born with a sin nature. How many times have I used the illustration? You don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to say, hey Johnny, come over here and sit down. Your dad's going to teach you how to lie. They know how. And soon enough they lie. And they get selfish. And they lose their temper. And they have a temper fit. Because they're sinners. So there's guilt, but there's the sin nature. It comes with birth. And if you look at that little innocent baby and hold it in your hands, and you think, oh my, that little innocent, little innocent lump of clay, we can just mold it any way we want to. That is not a little innocent lump of clay. It is a human being, a uh, never dying soul with a sin nature. And that's why it's so important for parents to train their children early. I'm saying that the two things that have to be dealt with, if a sinner is to be in a right relationship with God, is guilt and depravity. Depravity means we are as bad off as we can be. We're not, we're, we're not as bad as we can be. We can always be worse. But we're as bad off as we can be. Depravity means we have lost all ability to do anything good, to even want to come to Christ, or merit to come to Christ, or even on our own try to do so. We can't do it. Or you can be religious. You can join a church. You can say the sinner's prayer. You can occupy a seat in church and you can sing in the choir and get baptized and still go to hell. You can do all of those things. The one thing you can't do is to come savingly to Christ without God taking the initiative. That's depravity. You see, some religions teach that man is deprived and not depraved. So if man is deprived, the only thing you have to do is help him. Ephesians says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead doesn't mean almost dead, half dead. It means dead. And Paul says, those outside of Christ are dead spiritually in their trespasses and sin. That's depravity. Now, if a man is deprived, he still has some life. So I need to encourage him and I need to help him. And I need to give him the seven sacraments to get to heaven. <coughs> Big difference. Guilt, depravity. <coughs> now, what does God say he's going to do when he initiates that new covenant? He says, I'm going to take away their sins guilt. I will remember their iniquities no more. Dealing with guilt. And then he says, I will take away this basic bent to rebellion, anarchy, and indifference to my law. Turn with me to, are you there at Jeremiah 32? Let's look at verses 39 to 41. Again. 
and I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good. Now notice, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. Does that spell perseverance? Does that spell preservation? Indeed it does. There, God is saying that his people will not only be preserved by him, he is saying they will persevere in the ways of God. What did Paul say? In Philippians, we studied it. Paul says, I am convinced that he who began a good work in you will complete it, perfect it, unto the day of Jesus Christ. What God initiates, what God starts, he finishes. He doesn't do half a job. He doesn't get thwarted. He doesn't get disinterested and give up. He doesn't get tired and say, I've fooled with you long enough, I'm through with you. He will perfect it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So, if a person is saved, can he be lost again? Can he? No. 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 Why are people, God's people preserved and why do they persevere? Because God enters into a covenant with them. That's why. It's a covenant that God initiates, sealed by the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ pleads for the fulfillment of that covenant before God, a covenant which cannot be broken. The child of God, yes, may stumble and fall. And he does. And we read in the Bible the accounts of those falls. But there are promises. The steps of a man are established by the Lord and he delights in his way. When he falls, he shall not be hurled headlong because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I've been speaking mainly to your heads. I want to speak to your heart. Christian, as you said here to me, I don't know how long you've been saved. Maybe a short time. Maybe years. But I want to ask you a question. And it's this. Can you think back during your Christian life of those times when you became very distant from the Lord? You got away from Him. And the first thing that went was reading your Bible. Maybe just kind of glancing at it, not getting any good out of it. The next thing that went was your prayer. The next thing you went, what went was being in the house of God with God's people and worshiping. And you were in the desert. You were alien. You were away from God. You remember that happening? What else do you remember? As you said here today, you remember somehow God got a hold of you. God gave you a good shaking. God got, by the way, God knows how to get your attention. Right? And when God is getting your attention, you better listen. But you're sitting here today and you can reflect back on that and you know that it was the faithfulness of God that brought you back and back into fellowship. God rescued you. Why? Why? Because God had covenanted the blessings of the covenant would be blessings that would keep you from casting off faith and obedience in your life and, and departing from God forever. 
Proverbs says the righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in the time of calamity. There's no record of his rising again. How many times have we read, maybe memorized Romans chapter 8? What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who or what can be against us? Nothing, effectively. He that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Things necessary to complete the realization of our salvation. Now, there's a second reason from God's standpoint why we persevere. And I alluded to that earlier. It's the work of the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's the work of recreation. It's the work of redemption. And each person of the Trinity has a distinct place and work. It is the work of God the Father to do the choosing. Ephesians 1. In him we were chosen before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God the Father did the choosing and chose us in Christ. Never think of this doctrine of election apart from being in Christ. God didn't choose any except as he saw them in Christ. We were chosen in him, in him Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, live a holy life, not a fire escape to get us out of hell and get us into heaven and live like the devil on the way. Huh. He wants a holy people. That was the whole purpose. So the Father's part in redemption is electing foreknowing and electing and to predestine them to be like Christ. Now, what is the peculiar ministry of the Son? Jesus Christ pur purchasing and interceding. That's the work of Christ. He paid the price. He purchased us on the cross. He paid the price. He is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Turn with me to Ephesians 5 and look at verse 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved so loved the church and gave himself up for her. I'll give you a minute to find it. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Notice in verse 27, get the impact of this, that he might present to himself the church. Complete, not half the church, not three quarters of the church, the church. Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should, should be holy and blameless. What is the object, the distinct object of the purchasing work of Christ? Why did he die in order to purchase did he die just to make people savable? To make salvation a possibility for those who would see it as a good deal? Not at all. He actually made a purchase. He was a substitute for those for whom he died. I believe it's in the book of Psalms that says, He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. How could he be satisfied if one for whom he died perished? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. He made a purchase. People come into my bookstore and make a purchase 
And when they walk out of the bookstore, they walk, they walk out with what? With what they purchased. Christ is not going to be without what he purchased. He purchased it. It's his. And he purposed it, purchased it for a reason. To have a church that he might present it to himself in glory. Not half a church. Why do the saints persevere? Because of the triune work of God the Father the Christ, and Jesus Christ the Son. And of course, the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. What is his distinct ministry? Sealing and sanctifying. Sealing and sanctifying. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. And it is by the Holy Spirit that we mortify sin and become more and more conformed to his image. Do you not see, dear people, what is involved in the saving of a soul? The triune God is involved from beginning to end. Why do saints persevere? Because they're preserved by God. I'm wondering about some who may be here today who are unsaved. You're not savingly joined to Christ. You may be religious. You may be a member of some church. Where will you spend eternity? You have been made for eternity. Your soul will live somewhere forever and ever and ever. And the Bible speaks of only two places, heaven or hell. That's very serious and should take it serious. Facing eternity. How can you face eternity with anything less than the blessed triune God initiating in you that new covenant and savingly drawing you to himself? The scripture said that it's a blessed thing to be in the hands of the living God. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a judging and condemning God. We urge you to come to Christ. Christ himself said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. That could not be more true than if physically Christ was standing here and spoke those words himself. They are his words. <coughs> he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. We invite you to come to Christ. You might say, Pastor, I don't know really what that means to come to Christ. Well, when we pray here in just a moment, I would urge you just to Lift your heart up to God and say, God, I'm not sure what all it means to come to Christ. I'm not sure what that means. But best I understand it, best I know it, I'm coming to you. I'm putting my trust and my confidence in you and in you alone for my eternal salvation. Let's pray. Our gracious God, You see our hearts. You know our hearts. You know our true spiritual condition. And we would pray and ask that it might please you this day to do that work of saving grace that you alone can do in the hearts of those who are still outside of Christ. 
May you affectionately call them and draw them to yourself. May you initiate with them the new covenant. Remember their sins no more. Write your law upon their hearts that they shall never depart and be yours for all eternity. We ask and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.